Okay, so uh, let me introduce Pat and David. Uh, tonight's talk is the top national landmarks in New England for art and literature lovers. Patricia Harris and David Lyon, authors of uh, Historic New England, a tour of the region's top 100 national landmarks. And I just admitted someone, there we go. Uh, uh, we'll discuss 12 national landmarks located in New England that are connected to famous art and literature. Some of the sites to be discussed, and you know what, I'm gonna skip that part and we'll build suspense, okay? We won't even talk about what's gonna be talked about. So Pat and David are authors of more than 30 books on travel, food, and art. Uh, Harris uh, previously directed funding programs in several disciplines for the Mass Council on the Arts and Humanities, the predecessor to the Mass Cultural Council. And Lyon was one of the founders of the Lynx House Press they both live in Cambridge, not far from the Longfellow House. So all 32 of us, let's give a big round of applause to David and Patricia, and David and Patricia, take it away. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. As um, you know, we said to some of you um, who signed in first, this is our first Zoom presentation, so this looks like it's gonna be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us and Robert, you know, for inviting us. And um, as, as Robert said, David and I are freelance writers and we specialize in travel and food and the arts. And we've traveled with some of our friends who have joined us here tonight. Um, we contribute often to the Boston Globe travel section and to the magazine. And we um, also have done, as Robert said, a number of traditional guidebooks to Boston and New England, including the Eyewitness and Top 10 series that are published in Great Britain. But tonight we're going to be talking about this book, first slide, which is, I think, really a more personal book for us. It's our choice of the top 100 national landmarks in um, New England. And when it was first published about two years ago, Robert very kindly invited us, invited us up to give a talk at the library. And we thought it was a really, really nice evening. And we felt very, very, very welcomed by about the same size crowd that we have here tonight. Um, so thank you for you know, inviting us again, and this time to join you in your homes. Now, if any of you were at that original talk, don't worry, tonight's presentation is going to be different. So by our count, there are about 400 National Historic Landmarks in New England. And in fact, New England as a region um, has the third highest concentration um, only behind New York and California. And my friend Priscilla is here today from, from California, our friend. Um, so uh, the National Park Service says that National Historic Landmarks are very difficult designation to receive is limited to those spots that tell important stories related to the history of the nation overall. So we had honestly a hard time taking that list of 400 and cutting it down to 100 for the book. And as we were trying to make our decisions, we kept noticing that a lot of the sites were places where artists and writers had done some of their best and most enduring work. So those are the dozen places that we want to talk with you about tonight. We kind of think of it as the magic of place. And um, I'm gonna apologize now that I'm gonna to have to read a little bit, but I'm gonna give it to David to take it away. Well, <clears throat> come on. No, it's not. It's just supposed, sorry, we've got a little technical glitch here. There we go. That's better. This is um, this is Chesterwood. This is the home and studio. This is actually the studio of Daniel Chester French, a, a sculptor, uh, for more than three decades. Now he left his mark on uh, America with his masterful public sculptures that memorialized everybody from the Concord Minuteman to author Washington Irving. But he's probably best known for his masterpiece which is the seated figure of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. But he also left his mark on the birth shows, where he put his face and talent to work. David, can I stop you for one second? Yes. So David, when you turn your head to yes. your left, um, just slightly. You can't hear me. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Great. <Hold> <laughs> okay. 
Is that good? Actually, it's not showing. Okay, that's fine. Um, but it wasn't until he settled here in uh, Stockbridge, Massachusetts, that he uh, emerged as kind of a preeminent American memorial sculptor. He purchased this working farm in Stockbridge in 1897 and laid out his estate and focused his best views towards 1,642 foot Monument Mountain. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, he turned his attention first to the studio. You saw the outside, now this is the inside of it. Um, the Italianate style building was completed the next year, 1898, and featured a 26 foot high ceiling uh, that could accommodate equestrian figures too large for his New York studio. You see here one of his one quarter scale models of the seated Lincoln, by the way. Uh, windows and a north facing skylight provided plenty of light, but that wasn't enough for French. He also had railroad tracks installed. So when he wanted to look at these sculptures in the open air and sunlight, he would simply throw open the barn doors at one end of the studio and use a railroad hand cart to roll the piece outside. French also took a pretty active uh, interest in every aspect of the landscape. The property remained a working farm, but he also loved the formal gardens and laid out some woodland paths that he enjoyed strolling. In fact, he would uh, sometimes exhibit his own sculpture and that of some of his friends on the grounds. And that's one of the practices that the trustees of reservations, which owns Chesterwood, uh, has revived with annual sculpture ex sculpture exhibitions on the grounds. I don't know if they'll be doing that this year. You know, everything's sort of up in the air, but we'll find out. Uh, anyway, when you do visit Chesterwood, please set aside plenty of time because it's a property you savor and you make sure you take a seat here on the back porch behind the wisteria trimmed back porch on the back of the studio and take in that view uh, it's sort of obscured by the top of the slide, but that's Monument Mountain. You're looking straight at it. Uh, in 1911, French wrote to a friend, it is as beautiful as fairyland here now. I go about in an ecstasy over the delight in the, lovely, in the loveliness of things. Moving on. We are moving just a little ways up the room. And this is Arrowhead in Pittsfield. Now, as David mentioned, Daniel Chester French um, was sort of drawn to his property because it had that nice view of Monument Mountain. So we like to think that when author Herman Melville went looking for property in the Berkshires, he chose this site because it had a view of the great hump of Mount Greylock on the northern horizon. And Mount Greylock is 3,491 feet tall, which is the tallest mountain in Massachusetts. And thanks to Melville, I think it looms even larger in literary lore. And one of what I really think is our country's most amazing literary feats, Melville sat here in land He gazed at Mount Greylock, conjured up a whale, and wrote America's great novel of the sea, Moby Dick. Now, it's not, it is an incredible feat, but it's not quite as far-fetched as you might um, imagine. As a young man, Herman Melville had spent 18 months aboard the whaling ship of Cushnet. So he had plenty of stories and experiences that he could draw from. And you don't have to be too much of a romantic to think that um, Mount Greylock does kind of look like a whale. There's a stretch in the in the winter is covered with snow for months and months usually, and kind of steam rises off the mountain, almost like more like fog than steam. But in either case, Melville's days aboard the long ship were well behind him when he bought this 160 acre farm back in 1850. And he named it Arrowhead because he found a lot of those Native American artists. So P Patricia, can I stop you for a second? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Um, so you're dropping out a little bit. And okay. I think it's what happens when you kind of move. I think if oh. you were to kind of be as still as possible. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and and uh, sometimes you're um, kind of turning up just, just a bit to your right. And so I would just try to look straight ahead. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. You're kind of our, our guinea pigs. We apologize. Oh, we you're you're my guinea pigs, so that's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. So, he bought the farmhouse in 1850, and he lived in it with his wife, Elizabeth Knapp Shaw, their four children, Melville's mother, and his sister. So, it was a crowded household. And he really didn't, he was a writer, but he didn't shy away from the life of a farmer. He had a worker and the two of them, they grew um, squashes, pumpkins, turnips, corn, herbs, and other crops. He made cider every year from the apples from his own orchard and he kept a chicken coop. But he also found plenty of time to write. And a lot of scholars consider that the 13 years that he spent here in the Berkshires were the most productive of his career. So the Berkshire Historical Society owns the property now and they present it as a museum. I think they do quite a good job. And this is my favorite room. It's the um, Melville study on the second floor. And as you can see, it's got a desk in one corner and then this very big writing table and chair looking out the window toward Mount Greylock. And, you know, unlike today when there'd just be a little laptop computer on this desk, you know, there's an inkwell and quill pens, um, you know, a candle, his glasses, and then a um, copy of a much annotated manuscript. So after he finished the farm chores in the morning, this is where Melville would come and spend the afternoon working on his writing. And when he felt he'd done enough for the day, he'd join the family. And they'd often go for a walk on some of the upper pastures. But he also had a piazza built on the north side of the house, and it was one of his favorite spots. And he'd often just sit there, look out across that meadow, which was all his property, and that is Mount Raylock looming in the horizon, far horizon. Oh, up the Connecticut River a little bit to uh, Cornish, New Hampshire. Uh, and this is the St. Gaudens National Historic Site in Cornish. Just as French had Monument Mountain and Melville had Mount Greylock, Augustus St. Gaudens took special comfort in his long southwestern vista past Mount Escutney, visible there on the right, into the setting sun. He ended up making some of his greatest and most enduring work at this home and studio in Cornish, New Hampshire. Now, St. Gaudens was kind of a wonder boy of American uh, art in his day. He burst onto the scene with his very first commission in 1876. And that was this, this is a later casting of it, but it was this statue. It was a monument to Civil War Admiral David Farragut. And this is the later casting preserved at the Cornish site. Unveiled in 1881, the Farragut Monument made St. Gaudens' career immediately at a time when America was hungry for public monuments. After the wrenching experience of the Civil War, we were eager to celebrate our heroes and create a national air of imperial permanence. New York was the center of the American universe during this golden age, and St. Gaudens was the toast of the town. Now, all that sudden fame and success was reason enough to want to get out of Manhattan. Flush with commissions, by 1885, he was looking for a summer retreat. His childhood friend and lawyer, Charles Beeman, offered him a former country inn in Cornish, New Hampshire. And St. Gaudens thought the building was really ugly, but his wife, Augusta, had a better eye for landscape, and her vision prevailed. Uh, they rented for a couple of years, converting a hay barn into a studio and modifying the house to suit their needs. And in 1892, they bought the property outright. Now, St. Gaudens transformed the Cornish land the way he transformed American public sculpture by injecting a kind of heroic scale into otherwise plain lines. He named the house Aspet after his father's birthplace in Gascony, and it evolved into an estate with studios, formal gardens, a lawn bowling green, he was a fool for lawn bowls, uh, a toboggan run, nature trail, a nine-hole golf course, pervasive and romantic sense of well-being. It was also the social center for the Cornish art colony, which was a bohemian bunch of rapscallions who shocked and outraged their New Hampshire neighbors with their love affairs and general carryings on. Aspet was, in fact, 
the St. Gaudens family home from 1885, or summer home, I'm sorry, from 1885 to 1897. But once the sculptor was diagnosed with cancer in 1900, it became their permanent home until his death in 1907. It was here that St. Gaudens eventually reduced to overseeing his assistance in the comfort of his portable sedan, would complete some of his finest work, including this image of Diana from Madison Square Garden, and this miniature bar relief of the Standing Liberty that is still the face of the gold bullion coinage from the U.S. Mint. For 20 years, St. Gaudens would lounge on the front porch and watch the day march down the hill in contented rustic splendor. Even toward the end, the landscape lifted him up. In his last winter, he wrote to a friend about a crisp sheet of snow, said, sun brilliant and supreme, sleighs, sleigh bells galore, and a cheerfulness that brings back visions of the halcyon winter days of my boyhood. Now I'm going to give you a little change of pace. We're moving on to the New England coast. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Herman Melville set up, sat up there in Western Mass on his farm. He gazed at Mount Greylock and conjured a great novel of the sea. And I just, I think it just kind of goes to show how closely New England and New Englanders are connected to the sea. And it's not just writers who feel its pull. Um, painters have set up, the, set up their easels all along the long and varied New England coast for centuries, really. And I'm guessing it's a at least here in Cambridge, it's a pretty nice night. And I'm guessing there's probably with an easel somewhere along the coast painting a sunset view, even as I speak. But the two spots I'm going to talk about now, I think loom especially large in the history of American art. And this is the Winslow Homer studio on Prout's Neck in Scarborough, Maine. Now, Homer was actually a Boston native, and it took him quite a while to find kind of both the place and the subject matter that really established his career. Um, <clears throat> he worked as an apprentice lithographer. He covered the Civil War for Harper's Weekly. He became a, a master watercolorist, and he chronicled kind of charming rural New England scenes. And he also spent a year in Paris and a little bit longer than that in a fishing village on the northeast coast of England. So he finally returned to the United States in 1883 and his family seemed to want to keep him close by. His father and brother gave him this carriage house which was behind their much larger, much more grand property on um, Prout's Neck. They were much more business-minded than Homer, and in fact, they were developing the, the whole peninsula as a summer community. So um, Homer once remarked that it's a rare thing to find a painter who knows a good thing when he sees it. And it turns out that actually Homer was one of those rare painters. He spent the last quarter century of his life here in his studio and home on, um, on Prout's Neck. Um, and the property is now owned by the Portland Museum of Art. And normally they offer guided tours in the summer. You're gonna have to check this year. Um, but the family enlarged the carriage house a few years after Homer moved in, but he really didn't have much interest in those kind of creature comforts. As you can see, it kind of looks like a fishing camp inside. And he actually lived there with no electricity or running water ever the whole time you know, he was there. What mattered to him is what David's showing here on the next slide. This was his front yard, this incredible rock-bound coast of Maine. And he painted it again and again and again. And he especially seemed drawn to it in stormy weather. Now, overall, there are 22 oil paintings, seven watercolors, and a few etchings that can be definitively traced to his time at um, his studio on Prout's Neck. And they include one of his real masterpieces. This is it. It's stormy weather. And it is now in the collection of the Portland Museum of, of Art. Um, now, he died in 1910, but I think it's fair to say that these iconic images of the main coast, really no one has captured them better than Homer was able to. But you know, other artists found other visions. 
and I'm, I'm kind of reminded of a trip that David and I took a couple of years ago to Monhegan Island, which is um, off the coast of Maine. And they have, um, you know, a lot of lobster fishermen live there. And they also have a really active community of year round and seasonal painters. And we were really surprised. We were there to write about the art scene. And a lot of the artists would set up their easels in a neighbor's garden where, um, the laundry was hanging on a clothesline. They turned their back on these incredibly amazing, dramatic, rocky coasts for the more intimate, domestic kind of scene. And this actually now is the Connecticut coast because the American Impressionist artists of the old line art colony, they had a singular a similar penchant for the more cultivated Connecticut coast with its long stone walls, you know, beautiful Georgian and federal homes, um, rolling meadows and saltwater marshes. Now, Florence Griswold was the daughter of a sea captain and she lived in one of those beautiful um, Georgian homes. Here it is. But she was all alone in this great big house and when her circumstances became kind of difficult she did what a lot of ladies did in that time and she opened her house to boarders now as luck would have it landscape painter and teacher henry ward ranger discovered miss griswold when he was he left new york and began scouting um, painting locales along the long island sound in the summer of 1899 and he pronounced Old Lyme the perfect place with the perfect subject matter for American artists who wanted to create their own unique version of Impressionism. And in fact, a lot of artists apparently really listened to him. You know, for more than 30 years, Florence Griswold was the genial landlady to um, about 200 artists over time who spent their summers in old line and you know stayed at her house and today is this is the florence griswold museum it's really a beautiful place now by all counts the artists were actually a really genial fun loving group in the evenings they would gather in the parlor and they might play card games or just talk about art and they would listen to miss florence um, play her harp and here she is this painting actually is right as you enter the house by the door um, and, you know, I think, you know, it kind of, they, it boosted all their artistry to have this really, you know, nice um, environment and way of, you know, talking with each other. Um, you know, and there was a little bit of competition, but that probably helped as well. Now, one of the best things about visiting the house is that you can see these painted scenes, artists painted right on the doors and also onto the mahogany panels that are set you know, in the, in the walls. And it was um, a group of artists actually would decide each year who would have the honor to paint one of these panels. And it was considered, you know, quite, as I said, an honor to, you know, have this kind of recognition. And there are 41 painted panels in all. And among the most striking are the ones that were painted by Child Hassam. He had a really particular way of catching the, the shifting quality of the light along the Connecticut coast that kind of came to kind of define the old line style of painting. And I should tell you, I, I do hope they're going to be able to open this summer. And if you go, there's still quite an active art scene in old line. There are a number of painters that are still working there and some galleries that you can visit. So it's really easy to make it a nice day trip. Well, those of you who came to our first presentation may recognize this. Uh, and this is the Robert Frost Farm in Derry, New Hampshire. And in September 1900, 26 year old Robert Frost moved into the old Magoon place on the south side of Derry, along with his young family and 300 Wyandotte chickens. The house was a classic 19th century New England farmhouse, consisting of what architectural historian Thomas Hubka calls big house, little house back house and barn and so it remains today now i have a personal connection to frost sojourn here since i moved to Derry exactly 70 years later school at pinkerton academy funny thing frost discovered he wasn't much of a farmer and in 1906 he too began teaching at pinkerton now lightning rarely strikes twice, but I kept waiting that whole year that I taught there, wishing that someone like Ezra Pound would discover me and get my first book of poems published. 
but I was no Robert Frost. <laughs> but here's the thing, neither was Frost when he first settled here. This is the landscape that haunts his books for decades and decades later. And this is where Rob Frost, family man and chicken farmer, became Robert Frost, one of the singular voices of American literature. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, he famously wrote. And there, behind the farmhouse, at the edge of the apple orchard, exactly as he described it, the old stone wall remains, its topmost stones tumbled by the frost bees. Now it's easy to imagine young Rob Frost walking down the wall in the springtime with his neighbor on the other side, mending those tumble down gaps. Good fences make good neighbors, the man insisted, and Frost, in his own cagey way, was never clear if he agreed. The poet's oldest child, Leslie Frost Ballantyne, discovered, uh, directed the restoration of the farmhouse as a New Hampshire state park and historic home, and her living memory conjured up the touchstone details to make it seem like the poet just stepped out, including this peculiar Blickensdurfer typewriter on the kitchen table as well as the party line telephone for Frost eavesdropped to, as he put it, the speech of his neighbors. What you can't see, though it's easy enough to imagine, in courtesy of Google Images, we have let you imagine it. Uh, from an upstairs window, Frost taught astronomy to his children at night. Each child had a star that was his or her own, and he told them that for all their lives, wherever they might be, they were never alone. All they had to do was look to the night sky and find their family. I just love that idea. But I'm going to talk to you about um, something Cushing, Maine. And it's where Andrew Wyeth painted Christina's world. You know, an image that I think is as easily recognizable as Robert Frost's tumble down wall. And it has made this really modest farmhouse, saltwater farm, <laughs> so the painting Christina's World is owned by the Museum of Modern Art and I probably don't even have to describe it to you and this is actually a photo that David took a few years ago in late June and it's amazing except for there's not a figure in it how much it looks like the landscape still today but the painting um, shows Christina Olson who could not work lying in the grass yeah. Well, could not walk, excuse me, thank you, lying in the grass at the bottom of this hill, gazing up towards the house. Now, what's so good about art is that you can interpret it any way you want. Maybe it's longing, determination, loneliness. Everyone can, you know, make their own decision about that. But no matter what, it really established Wyeth's career. Um, and he was drawn to the, he, um, he was introduced to Christina Olsen and her younger brother, Alvaro, in 1939. And Betsy James, who became his wife about a year later, made the introduction. And you, actually, you may have read, she just died last year. She was 98 years old. Uh, and well, I don't know, Wyeth was just really drawn to this saltwater farm with its really um, weathered buildings. And I think equally to the two siblings who eked out their life here. You know, he painted them, their house, their farm, again and again and again from 1939 until the siblings died within a month of each other in late 1967 and early 1968. And over that time, he succeeded in creating this body of work that seems both highly particular, yet somehow universal. And um, let's see, so the isolated peninsula was settled by three brothers from Salem, Massachusetts in the 1740s. And then over the years, their heirs took one of their original cabins and kept expanding it and expanding that in, in that kind of New England serial architecture kind of way that David was um, talking about earlier. And in the late 19th century, the family members even took in summer boarders. Um, Christina and Alvaro inherited the property in, in 1929, and it remained in you know, their home and in their property until they died. And obviously they had plenty of room in that big rambling house. So they offered Wyeth a second floor bedroom to use as a studio and he gladly accepted and it clearly suited him very well. This is actually the view he would have 
from the window of his studio. And he once commented that I just couldn't stay away from there. I did other pictures while I knew them, but I always seemed to gravitate back to the house. It was Maine. So the south facing property sits on a point between two rivers and with a singular slant of light, it has become Maine, I think, for millions of viewers. Now the Farnsworth Museum in near, nearby Rockland um, owns the house and usually opens it for tourists during the summer. And I can't really tell you what this horse was doing when we visited, but it was just too funny, you know, <laughs> they couldn't resist putting it in. So the Farnsworth Museum, though, to get back to that, um, they were an early supporter of Wyatt's work. Um, they purchased, purchased six of his paintings in 1954 and had a major exhibition of his work as early as 1951. And now they've um, taken on the responsibility to be the steward of one of these most iconic scenes in American art. Ready to move on three properties, all in Concord, Massachusetts, all associated with people who all have three names. Um, <laughs> Concord probably has more national historic landmarks per capita than any other place in New England. And you know, in the mid 19th century, it was very fashionable, especially among Boston intellectuals, to say, to call Boston the Athens of America. But that term probably should have been reserved Concord, because that's where a group of men and women forged a self-consciously American philosophy and literature uh, in the middle of that in the 19th century. And the leader of the pack was the so sage of Concord, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson was born in Concord in 1803 and died in Concord in 1882. In the last 70, in the 79 years in between, he revolutionized American thought. Improbably enough, this rather modest home remains intact exactly as he lived in it when many of the great minds of his age came as pilgrims. In fact, the dining room table six, six, sits 16 people, 18 in a pinch. It kind of points to Emerson's particular gift for friendship. Now, the, this domestic sphere of the Emerson house represents the world that inspired him. Several of his personal walking sticks still stand in the hallway. He would use them on his jaunts, often to Walden Pond, uh, where he owned several house lots. Along the way, he would ruminate. As he recounted in his seminal essay, Nature, this, the charming landscape which I saw this morning is indubitably made up of 20 or 30 farms. Miller owns this field, Locke that, and Manning the woodland beyond, but none of them owns the landscape. You see, to Emerson, son and grandson of, peacher, of preachers, divinity resided in nature and in the landscape. And the semi-tamed world of Concord for him was heaven enough. Ultimately, he constructed his philosophy of the good life as a family man, as an individual connected to the larger society around him. In the front hall stairway of the house, and later bronze of the clay model of Emerson's bust that in fact Daniel Chester French made in 1879. Now by that time, Emerson's faculties were failing him. But in one of his more lucid moments, he confirmed the veracity of the image, commenting, this is indeed the face I shave every morning. Now for American lit majors, you know, the names of conquered authors become intertwined like Abbott and Costello, you say Emerson, I say Thoreau, and this is Walden Pond. I can't think of another landscape in New England more integral to an author's thought than Walden Pond. Henry David Thoreau didn't live to see his 45th birthday, but he packed a lot of living into those short years. Thoreau's two-year experiment of dwelling in a cabin on the shores of Walden Pond, Walden Pond which he compressed to a single year, in his uh, 1854 book, Walden, has made this spring-fed glacial kettle pond and its surrounding woods into hallowed ground for American literature. When Thoreau floated the idea of living in splendid isolation close to nature, with a capital N, of course, uh, his friend and mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, had just the spot. 
Emerson had purchased 11 acres on Walden Pond, and the two of them would go on long woodsy walks there. So off Thoreau went, as he famously wrote, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and to see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. The isolation was a bit of fiction. <laughs> the cabin <laughs> was a mile and a half along the railroad path from Concord Village. And Thoreau was never quite so dependent on his uh, bean patch, which was actually a two and a half acre garden, as he would have readers believe. He rarely missed Lydian Emerson's um, spread at Sunday dinner, and he frequently came to town to babysit the Emerson children. Now, but now a state park, Walden Pond, is a busy place in the summer, and few traces of Thoreau's brief experiment persist. Around the pond and past the site of Thoreau's cabin, marked off here with these granite uh, pylons, makes it possible to recapture, if only for the moment, the plainy serenity that led the man that one of my English professors fondly called the crank of Concord mm -hmm. to dub the place in the parlance of Eastern philosophy, Lower Heaven. He wrote in chapter two of Walden. In other directions, even from this point, I could not see over or beyond the woods that surrounded me. It was well to have some water in your neighborhood to give buoyancy to and to float the earth. This is our final property in Concord. It's the orchard house, which I think is much more comfortable than Thoreau's cabin. When I first visited the orchard house, I was really surprised to learn that Louisa May Alcott was in her mid-20s before she and her parents and her two surviving sisters moved in here. Now, this house is just outside Concord Center, and it's within walking distance of the home of their family friend, you can guess it, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Louise's father, Bronson Alcott, was also a transcendentalist writer and thinker. But honestly, I think most people are much more interested in his daughter's writings today. Um, her novel, Little Women, paints such a rich picture of four girls growing up that it's easy to assume that Orchard House is where Louisa and her sisters um, were born and raised, but that wasn't the case at all. And in fact, the Alcott family had moved into 20 different homes before they moved into the Orchard House. So that's pretty amazing because she was only in her mid-20s. So she mustn't have spent much time anywhere before they arrived here. But when Bronson bought the house, it's an 18th century property, a friend of his wife, Abigail May Alcott, declared that it was only fit for pigs. But Bronson spent a year fixing up the house and then he kept tinkering with it and improving it for the two decades that the family lived here. Now in this much more settled and stable kind of home life, Louisa and her painter's sister May really blossomed. Um, the family was in pretty tight financial circumstances when they moved in, but each of the three daughters had their own bedroom. And May had a long, narrow room, and she was a painter, and she kind of used her walls as a, a canvas. And, um, you know, restorers have discovered some of her images of um, Greek gods and goddesses, chariots, mothers and children, and angels. Louisa, this is Louisa's room. She had a big room at the front of the house that looks out on Lexington Road. And her father built her this little semi-circular desk. And that is where she pulled up a chair to write. Now she had already had her first book published before she moved um, into, into Orchard House. But um, her career really took off when her publisher asked her if she could write a book for girls. By then, she was actually about 35 years old, but she didn't really seem to have too much trouble reaching back to her girlhood. And um, she actually didn't really lack for subject matter either, either because the Marsh family members are, March family members are, are really just thinly veiled versions of Louisa, her sisters, her father, and their beloved uh, mother, Marmy. Now, I always get this wrong, so I'm going to get it right this time. She wrote Little Women. This is really amazing, between May and July, 1868. And it was 
a big success, very well received right from the beginning. In fact, it has never gone out of print and countless young girls as diverse as punk rocker Patti Smith and Hillary Rodden, Rodden Clinton say that they were very much inspired by um, Louise's fictional counterpart, Joe March. Um, so uh, let's see, the family left the Orchard House after Marmee died in 1877, but I actually think that the house seems to still have that spirit of a loving family and it, what it actually really has, you don't need your imagination for it, is a lot of the, um, the Alcott family original furnishings. And the interpretation is done by the National Park Service. And I think that they really amply, amply reflect the kind of warmth of the family and their family life as their financial circumstances began to improve as, literary, as Louise's literary um, career took off. Now for something completely different. <laughs> There's no way I can convince you that the landscape of Hanover, New Hampshire was the inspiration for this uh, epic of American civilization by Jose Clemente Orozco. But it is one of the few pieces of art granted landmark status in its own right. The mural cycle was painted on the walls of the basement reading room at the Baker Berry Library at Dartmouth College in 1932 and 1934. Now, some years back, Pat and I had a chance to interview Churchill P. Jerry Lathrop. At that point, he was a professor emeritus of art history, but as a young professor in the 30s, he and a colleague invited Orozco to be an artist in residence at Dartmouth College. Along with Diego Rivera and David Alfred Siqueiros, Orozco was one of the giants of the mural movement that galvanized arts in Mexico after the Mexican Revolution. As Lathrop told us that day, mural painting is art's equivalent of public speaking, loud, forceful, and vibrant. We really admired Dartmouth College for giving Orozco more than 2,200 square feet to explore the themes of his revolutionary ideology in considerable depth. Now, working in true fresco style and with only vertical, horizontal, and diagonal guidelines on the walls, Orozco covered three walls of the room with 24 different compositions. They articulate his vision of life in the Americas, both before the arrival of the Europeans and after the conquest of Mexico. And the picture that, that emerges is far from flattery as he portrays the continuing cycle of repression and rebirth and takes particular aim at political, religious, and academic institutions. The mural cycle may be considered one of his finest works, but that's not to say it wasn't controversial from the start. Let's consider this panel. It's called Gods of the Modern World. The photo, by the way, is courtesy of the Hood Museum at Dartmouth. Uh, I couldn't hang from the ceiling to take it. Uh, Orozco painted skeletal figures in European and American academic robes presiding over the stillbirth of useless knowledge. We've got to give it to Dartmouth for allowing this rather audacious criticism to live on its walls. However, Orozco did end the cycle on a positive note, with his vision of a utopian future in which machines serve humankind and workers put down their tools to nourish their spirits. Dartmouth has been a very diligent steward of the work, installing climate-controlled and undertaking a major restoration to preserve the mural for, for posterity. As Jerry Lathrop told us that day, some years back, we knew we'd get a good painting, but we had no idea we'd get a masterpiece. Okay, everybody, hang in there. This is the last landmark. It's the glass house, Philip Johnson's glass house in New Canaan, Connecticut. And it's a good reminder that a property doesn't have to be really old to be a National Historic Landmark. And in fact, the program acted quickly to add the glass house to its ranks. Um, Philip Johnson, who is one of the leading mid 20th century architects, designed the house for his own use. And it was completed in 1949. And it helped turn the rather staid and traditional community of New Canaan into a modernist um, enclave. And the house became a National Historic Landmark in 1997, which was eight years before Johnson's death. 
And Johnson was one of five Harvard trained architects who settled here to build homes for themselves and for their clients. And the radical designs honestly were not always that well received. One critic declared that the architecture was as gracious as Sunoco service stations, which I always thought was kind of funny. But I also think what's funnier is that Johnson got the last laugh because his house has really stood the test of time. It is considered really one of the most important pieces of domestic modern architecture in the country. And Johnson liked to say that the house was just like his grandparents' house. It had a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, and a bedroom, all of which is true. And in that um, circular part there in the brick is where the mechanical systems and, and the bathrooms are. And I've always, I do think though that his grandparents probably didn't have to spend as much time you know, washing windows. So since we've been talking a little bit about landscape this evening, I should tell you that this house sits on a beautiful 49 acre lot that Johnson used to really full dramatic effect. If you want to take it for the properties owned by the um, Trust for National Trust for Historic Preservation, and they have a um, visitor center in downtown New Canaan where you meet and they take small groups by van to visit the property. So it's nice, you're never in, in a big crowd when you are enjoying the site. And you enter through the great big gate and then you the van twists and turns for, it seems like a really long time down this winding driveway. And all of a sudden you turn the corner and there it is. It almost just seems you know, like magic. Um, and he cited the house on a hill for maximum views. And he liked to say that it was the only house in the world where you could watch the sunset and the moon rise at the same time. So when they are offered, the tours of the house are very popular. So you have to reserve them pretty far in advance. And I was really disappointed the first time David and I had our scheduled reservation. It was raining and David will attest that I complained about it practically in the whole drive um, down in the car. But this is it. This is the rainy day. And as you can see, it was just gorgeous. And now I would really like to see it in the snow. And Johnson, in fact, said that the lighted house on a snowy evening makes it look as though you're rising on a celestial elevator. And we are going to leave you with that, very, I think, just a beautiful image and we want to thank you very much for, you know, um, for listening. And we're very sorry that we can't meet you all in person and autograph books for any of you who want to read more. But they are available on Amazon.com. And we should tell you that we're working on a follow-up. It's going to be called Historic Hub. And it's going to be our choice of 50 National Historic Landmarks in Greater Boston. So we will look forward to hopefully seeing you in Tewksbury in person when that book is published. Now, in the meantime, I know we're all getting a little stir crazy. And if you're starting to... You know,